Okay, I want to start you off this morning, make sure everybody's got the notes for today. The subject for today and probably the weeks ahead uh, is going to be on false teachings concerning salvation and the we're going to keep it under the umbrella of uh, Christianity. It's not everybody that claims to be a Christian is a Christian. And so we call them Christian religions, but more clarification and defining of terms and understanding needs to be addressed um, if it's uh, going to be considered biblical Christianity. Uh, it, the subject that we're going to cover today in the weeks ahead is an important one, and that is concerning salvation. The eschatology, or well, not eschatology, now I'm thinking in time events. Um, the, I'm at a loss for words, and I, I'm trying to search for them this morning, can't find them. We're talking about soteriology, Amen. systematic theology, that's what I was looking for. The systematic theology that we're going to be uh, covering, it, soteriology, and under that umbrella is salvation. And salvation is important. There's a lot of things that we debate about in Christianity and a lot of things that just won't amount to anything as far as your eternal security or salvation is concerned. But when we talk about salvation, that's critical. Amen. And I say that because the Bible says that it's critical. And so the first place this morning I want to have you turn to is um, 1 Corinthians 16. We'll go through these kind of quickly, and then I'll get into my, my notes a little bit and kind of back up a little bit more of what I'm, I'm trying to convey here this morning. There, there's, no, there's no room, there's no leeway when it comes to this. Either you're born again or you're not. Either you're born again or you're not. And if you're not born again, then you'll have access to heaven. There's just no other way for me to put that. Uh, you know, some want to soft pedal that and want to, you know, cut the edge off it a little bit, but there's really no cutting the edge off. Either you're saved or you're not. No. And so the, the question is, well, then how do I know I'm saved? That's what you need to find out. You need to examine yourselves and see whether or not you're in the faith. And if you're not, you need to get that matter settled with God quickly. Because you don't know. You know, your, your day or your number, as the expression goes, uh, could come up and that's it. Um, you know, your life here on earth comes to an end and your eternity begins. And so here in 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 22, this is again Paul writing, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be an anathema, maranatha. In other words, let him be accursed. So the starting point for anything is what is the position on the Lord Jesus Christ? And when we deal with religions within the context of Christianity, our first question ought to be, how do they deal with the person and work of Jesus Christ? The historical person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the question that you need to start with. And then you can ask other questions that fall underneath that. What do you believe concerning Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Is he divinity? Uh, did he die for the sins of mankind? Did he... Did he rise from the dead? Did he perform these miracles? Is he coming again? And those are questions that we ask of people. Where do you stand on the historical Jesus Christ, the biblical Jesus? And so if you are outside of that uh, framework, the Bible says, let them be an anathema. In other words, let them be accursed. Now jump ahead to uh, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, and beginning at verse number 3, the, the Bible says, Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. There aren't multiple gospels. 
There's one gospel of Christ. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, we'll read on. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. <coughs> this is the third time that Paul said this. We see the first one in Corinthians. We see it twice here in Galatians chapter 1. And then we'll, we'll just turn uh, to Colossians chapter 2 real quick. Colossians chapter 2, and <clears throat> I had us beginning in verse number uh, 4. Again, the context is, is, is Christ, and so beginning in verse number 4, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ, beholding your order. Multiple Gospels creates confusion and disorder. Mul in other words, let me frame it another way. Multiple salvations creates disorder and confusion. There's order, there's stability in Christ. He only is our rock. So it would behoove us to learn as much as we can about him. So we go on and we see verse number six. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Tonight we're going to be in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse number 13. And if he believe not, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Right. And so we'll get into that tonight. God can't be anything less than what he has declared himself to be. If he is less sovereign than what the Bible declares him to be, then he's no longer sovereign. Right. If he is not as faithful as the Bible declares him to be, then he's not faithful. Either you are or you're not. We like to, in our day and age, we like to kind of go down the middle of the road with that thing. There is no middle of the road, and we treat salvation the same way. Well, that's a decent person. They're kind people. They should be okay. They believe what they want. They're sincere in their beliefs, and so they're okay. God will find favor with them and welcome them into heaven. But that's not the way the Bible talks about salvation. And that is why it is important for us to be rooted and built up in the Lord Jesus Christ, as it states here. And then he gives us a warning. Paul is full of warnings throughout his epistles. Verse number eight. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The Roman Catholicism places a lot of focus and emphasis on tradition. The Bible's pretty clear that we're not to follow the traditions of men. The other thing, and not to pick on Roman Catholicism exclusively, but we see even in some of our churches, a lot of traditions that take preeminence above the word of God. Right. And we have to be careful of that too and root that out. Our focus, our primary focus in learning and allegiance is to be to Jesus Christ and not to philosophy and not to tradition. Right. And don't get me wrong, we have traditions even here. But they don't take precedence above the word of God and above Christ. There's some good traditions. There's some bad ones. After the rudiments of the world. I, I thought of pragmatism as far as that was concerned. A lot of churches are modeled after the world. Why? Because they want to try to be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They want to draw the world in or seeker sensitive as it were. Rick Warren was famous for this. When he built his church out there, he sent out a questionnaire asking, what would you like to see in the church? 
He sent out a questionnaire to lost people, asking lost people what you want to see in church. What do you think they're going to say? How do you think they're going to respond to that? And then make a church after the world. And so we are not going to model the church after the rudiments of the world. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. The church should be a church of transformed people. Amen. The church itself will model that transformation and its services and its worship, its lifestyle, everything will be modeled after God, after Christ and not after the world. Um, and so in the verse number nine, and again, what we, what we know about Jesus and what we know about God is going to determine how we live for him and it's going to affect our view on salvation. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all, not some, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Notice verse 10. Again, thinking tonight, uh, sometimes these lessons all sort of tie together. For ye are complete in him. That is to say, you are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it today? Again, think in salvation. My salvation is secured Amen. in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved because of Jesus Christ. I'm saved by him and not by my own might. And, and to add to that, I am kept by him and not by my own might. Everything that I need to live the life that Christ has called me to live is been, has been provided. And so he says, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So those are the three verses that I wanted to kind of get started on tonight. There, so I start off first by saying there aren't multiple ways or multiple options for how you want to get into heaven. And this has been the core in Christendom for many, many years. Well, this one says you need to get baptized in order to get a measure of grace. Uh, this one needs to, you know, you need to get saved and then you need to maintain works or you can be, you know, forgotten and left out. You lose your salvation or what have you. Um, it seems to be a lot more of that today. I was talking to a, a, a brother yesterday about that. It seems that more and more Christians are, are at least professing to be Christians believing that there's got to be some kind of works and some kind of effort, uh, some kind of personal sanctification in order to sustain salvation. And of course, that's not biblical salvation. That salvation is sustained by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We are kept by the power of God. One of the things that I've learned in studying the various religions and even cults uh, within Christendom and even outside of Christendom is that there are common themes that show themselves inevitably. And one of them, and we'll cover that a little bit today, is that of condemnation and wrath. Within Christendom, the false Christian religions and the cults, and even outside of that, but just for the lesson this morning, stay within the parameters of the, the Christian religion, there's the denial of the condemnation and wrath of God. Uh, this is one of those things that comes up quite often. How can God, who is a God of love, condemn anybody to hell? How can God judge anybody to hell? And, and the world and the liberal Christian really comes unraveled when you talk about the condemnation of God on the unregenerate. There's just, in their eyes, it's extremely offensive. But the reality of it, that's what the Bible says. That's why Jesus died. He came to save sinners. And so then we see the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't sufficient for others. In other words, they want to add a little bit of works into their salvation, uh, sustain a godly life, or sustain good works, and so forth and so on. And then, you know, hopefully, uh, that's the best they can do, hopefully, they did enough good works to uh, maintain their favor uh, with God. And so we talk about a number of those things, and you'll see the, the works type thing constantly coming up. You'll see this uh, hostility toward the wrath and judgment of God come up, and it'll, it centers around their knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, or I should say their lack thereof 
Again, knowing Jesus Christ, not just in part, but knowing what Jesus Christ said about condemnation, what Jesus Christ said about regeneration or being born again, those are critical things. We should start there. And so covering the first uh, false view of salvation, uh, second, on page number eight of your notes, universalism. The proper name is Unitarian Universalism. The two merged, I think, I think it was in the 50s, the two merged uh, together. So it's Unitarian Universalism. The basics of this system of belief is that all will be saved eventually. Uh, this is largely a part where you get the uh, God is too loving to send anyone to hell. That's where that teaching comes from. This is not a large group. Uh, the other mainline Christian denominations are much larger than the Unitarian Universalist. But because of the seismic shift culturally, where the predominant theme and mantra is you need to be accepting of everyone's beliefs morally and spiritually, I can see where the Unitarian Universalist Church uh, would grow from that because of their position. I'm gonna read those quotes to you shortly. These are direct quotes from their website. And so the Universalist Unitarian on scripture. Now this becomes very critical. The Reformation had the sola scriptura, uh, scriptures alone. That's a position that I hold to, and um, all, all of you hold to. I'm assuming everybody here holds to that. Uh, if you don't, then we need to have a talk. But we, have, we hold to the Bible as the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. It's consistent with scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and instruction in righteousness, that the workmen of God might be truly furnished unto all good works. We see again 2 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verses 20 and 21 uh, talking about the inspiration of the scripture again. Now, how does the Unitarian Universalist handle scripture? This is a direct quote from their website, and I quote, one might say that our life is our scripture. While Unitarianism and Universalism both have roots in the Protestant Christian tradition, where the Bible is the sacred text, we now look to additional sources for religious and moral inspiration. That's a direct quote from their website. You see the problem there? Once you open up multiple sources, now you come on the scene and say, look, the Bible says, yeah, but I don't believe the Bible is the final authority in all matters. I believe that the Koran is a good book. I believe the Book of Mormon is a good book. I believe the Vishnu. And, and you go right down the line, and what they want to, so they can hide behind any one of those books, whatever book, whatever religious teaching best suits their particular lifestyle and system of belief, that's what they're going to go with. So it goes on, the quote goes on, over two centuries our religious tradition, a living tradition, has branched out from its roots. We celebrate the spiritual insights of the world's religions, recognizing wisdom in many scriptures, end quote. That's directly from their website. So what is our position, what has been our position throughout church history? We believe the Bible is I, let me clarify, not the final authority, the only authority Amen. in all matters of faith and practice. Amen. They have multiple authorities, and that's why it's hard to pin them down. So if they have multiple authorities or scriptures, then rest assured their ideas on salvation are going to be as diverse. Let's look at the next point, the Unitarian Universalist on God. Uh, turn to... Actually, you know what, since we're in Colossians, let's go to 1 John 5, 20, and we'll go to the Gospel of John. First Epistle of John, chapter 5, And verse 20, the Bible says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This 
is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Jesus Christ is God and is eternal life. There is no other. Now let's jump back to John. We'll go backwards from my notes. John 17. Gospel of John 17. John 17, beginning of verse number 1, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There's one true God, one true Savior. Let's go to John 14. I'm going to start in verse number one. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Verse 7. If, is the conditional word, if, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. There's a whole lot packed into that verse. Jesus is saying right there, he's God. Amen. The views on Jesus Christ are going to determine how we view everything else how we view eternal life, how we view God. It is important that we get that part of it down. So the Unitarian Universalist starts first by departing from sola scriptura. They start from their departure from the scriptures alone. And that leads to a departure from theology proper or a proper understanding of God. Once this is done, then they begin to create and fashion a God after their own fallen image. Our view, and if it's a biblical view, and it should be a biblical view, will shape how we view the world, how we view ourselves, how we view life, how we view death, how we view heaven and hell. Our morals and spiritual lives are shaped by our views of God. And so therefore it is important that we get this part right. And again, we look at the Unitarian Universalist, and I quote, Unitarian Universalists have many ways of naming what is sacred. Some believe in a God, some don't believe in a God. Some believe in a sacred force at work in the world and call it love. Again, this is quoting from their website. Mystery, source of all, or spirit of life. We are thousands of individuals of all ages, each influenced by our cultures and life experiences to understand the ground of our being in our own way. Underscore that, in our own way. Unitarian Universalists are agnostic, theist, atheist, and everything in between, end quote. See? Again, false view on salvation. In their system, regarding salvation, no one is condemned. So because of the diversity in that particular system of religion, um, you can't pigeonhole them. You, you can't pin them down because one person might hold to 
Buddhism, another person might hold to Islam, another person will be a little bit more liberal in their beliefs, morally speaking, and so forth and so on. I believe the core system there with them is that as long as they do good works, uh, do good to others, then they'll be all set in the eyes of God. They don't believe, or they, they, like others, believe it doesn't matter what you believe, all will eventually be saved. There are others who hold to a reincarnation, so, you know, it continues on because of the admixture of uh, uh, plurality of their religious convictions. I have a number of verses there to reference, but I'm not going to get to them today. You can look those up uh, on your own time. But I wanted to quote this from, again, from uh, the Unitarian Universalist website. It states this, and I quote, Unitarian Universalist views about life after death are informed by both science and spiritual traditions. Many of us live with the assumption that life does not continue after death, and many of us hold it as an open question, wondering if our minds will have any awareness when we are no longer living. Few of us believe in divine judgment after death. It's in our religious DNA, the universalist side of our tradition, broke with the mainstream Christianity by rejecting the idea of eternal damnation, end quote. That's from their website. So it's not being made up. That's what they believe. Salvation is important. What did Christ preach concerning condemnation? Right. What did the apostles preach concerning condemnation? You know why they broke? Because they couldn't come to terms with this part of Christ's message. And so this church continues to have its influence. There's one here in Auburn. I think there's one in Worcester as well. Um, and then what I was talking about in the introduction here, a lot of the common themes seen in other, you know, false Christian religions is their denial of the divinity of Christ. Christ is deity. They deny the Trinity. Christ isn't God manifest in the flesh, which is the reason why I reference those verses in John. Jesus Christ is the very God manifest in the flesh. Amen. So the doctrinal heresies, and I'll close out here on verse number, uh, page 10, Unitarian Universalist doctrinal heresies, and there's, there's many of them, but the key ones here, virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the resurrection of Christ, the condemnation and wrath of God. Uh, the verses that I have referenced in this point, Romans 16, 17, Titus 3, 10, 2 Peter 2, 1, 1 John 4, 1, all deal with the issue of false teachers. And that is dealt with throughout the New Testament this organization, this religion, if you will, is heretical. There are heretical doctrines that are taught, and in particular regarding salvation. Paul's clear on this. If any other gospel other than that which I have preached is preached unto you, let them be accursed. I'm not making those words up. That's what Paul said. That's what the word of God says the instructional book that we have, that God has given us, that's what the Bible says. And so you can see why people departed from, they had certain convictions, albeit wrong convictions, and they couldn't deal with them, so you form your own religion. Same thing happened with Joseph Smith, uh, not, not Joseph Smith, I'm sorry, Charles Taz Russell, with the Russellites, they couldn't deal with the teaching on the condemnation of God to sinners. And so you just branch off, make a religion, and teach annihilation. And so that's where it goes. Well, we'll cover some more of this next week and the weeks ahead. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time and for this lesson. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon it. God, help us to learn and grow in grace. And may your gospel have free course in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.